Hi guys, welcome. I'm Jeannie Rosner. Um, I think I know most of you. There are some uh, Sharon Heights members here that I don't know and a few others, so welcome. This is Soul Food Salon. Uh, we started this almost five years ago and my mission is to educate and empower us to be healthier. So today I have the honor to, uh, and to introduce Mary Nessel. So she, um, unbelievable, so I, I just don't even know where to start, but I will. So she's a professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health at NYU. She chaired the department at NYU from 1988 to 2003. She has a PhD in molecular biology and master's in public health nutrition at, from UC Berkeley. She has quite a presence here in California, actually. She's written numerous books. Um, all, and her research and writing all examine scientific and socioeconomic influences on our food choices. Um, the books, uh, many of her books are here for sale. Today she's going to be talking about uh, her most current book that just was released maybe about a week or so ago. And uh, that's called Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat. So she's received numerous accolades, numerous honors. One of my favorite favorites is um, in 2011 from the University of California School of Public Health, she was named uh, Public Health Hero. So with no further ado, I welcome Mary Nessel. <laughs> thank you, Jeannie. Um, and thank all of you for coming. You risked your life to come here. <laughs> I mean, and you're not wearing masks. You all should be, well, I'm a public health person. Everybody should be wearing a mask. So thank you very, very much for coming. It really makes me feel good. Um, this is, I'm here to talk about my latest book, and I have to say this book is really fun to talk about. Um, I, it, I'm kind of surprised at how much fun it is to talk about. I'm not sure it was that much fun to write, and the production of it was very difficult, but, um, let me um, talk about it. So um, I've been writing about food politics for a very long time. I have lots of books about food politics. And this book has a, this book came out directly from my previous work. And it turns out that in a stroke of absolutely amazing timing, I'm writing, a, this book is about a topic that is extremely public right now. And that is conflicts of interest and problems with, uh, with research in general, with science, and in particular with nutrition research. And uh, the, uh, medical and science journals like JAMA and Science uh, have had whole issues devoted to the question of uh, improperly done science. And it turns out there's a whole new field that I didn't even know about called meta-research. Um, which is the study of the study of science. And it turns out I'm a meta-researcher. I didn't know that. Uh, let me give you an example of what this is about in general. I mean, I, this was an article from the New York Times from March of this year um, in which a reporter, Ronnie Karen Rabin, wrote a series of articles about how the alcohol industry had given the National Institutes of Health enormous amounts of money, $67 million, to do a $100 million trial of uh, one drink a day and the effects of one drink a day on heart disease risk. And um, her, and she got a tip from somebody who worked at NIH that all was not on the up and up on this trial. She investigated, she used Freedom of Information Act to get emails between the investigators and the people who were doing the trial and the officials at NIH. And she was able to demonstrate um, what was certainly untoward influence of the alcohol industry on the investigators who were doing the trial, the design of the study, and the outcome of the study. Essentially, the investigators promised the alcohol industry that their study would show that one drink a day reduced the risk of heart disease. And they would not run the trial long enough to demonstrate whether alcohol had any effect on breast cancer risk or any other risk. Uh, when these articles came out, uh, this was very embarrassing to the NIH, big surprise. And the head of NIH said, OK, we'll do an investigation. He appointed a committee to look into this whole matter. 
Uh, that was in March. By May, they halted enrollment in the trial because it must have been obvious that the early results of the investigation were showing that this really wasn't going according to protocol. When the report came out, it was absolutely scathing about the NIH um, Institute's promise to the alcohol industry um, that it, this study would show benefit, and they stopped the trial. Even though they had already spent $4 million on enrollment in it, they stopped it. Um, the result of this was enormous embarrassment for NIH and all these articles like this, how corporate funding can distort research even at the National Institutes of Health. So basically, that's what this book is about. That all came out after the book had gone to press. Uh, the JAMA is special issue on conflicts of interest, which came out in 2017, defined conflict of interest as a situation in which your professional judgment about something, such as patients' welfare or the validity of research, is influenced by money, basically. Um, I'm going to talk about food industry influence on nutrition research because I'm interested in food. I write about food politics. This is food politics. When I talk about the food industry, in this book at least, I'm talking about the companies that make and manufacture and sell all of the products that we love to buy in grocery stores. Um, these enormous multinational companies that sell these products all over the world, we love them. And we buy them in absolutely enormous amounts. Now, I want to make it very clear that I am aware of the argument that personal responsibility for food choice is what we should be paying the most attention to. No food company is holding a gun to our heads, insisting that we buy their products. It's up to us to decide whether we buy their products. And this is the personal responsibility argument. Um, that yes, the food industry attempts to influence but us, but we're adults, we should be able to make our own decisions about these things. And I'm completely aware of that argument. Uh, one of the things about that argument that fascinates me is that if you go on to Google and Google influences on food choice, you will get dozens and dozens and dozens of diagrams that look just like this one. This one's a little cleaner than most of them, so I like it. But what, a f what I find fascinating about it is the absence of anything related to the food industry on this formulation. It talks about peer pressure and lifestyle and cost and health beliefs, religious and moral considerations, food trends, skills, personal choice. Not one word about food industry efforts to try to sell you food products as if they were invis invisible. They're supposed to be invisible. If you're doing your marketing right, nobody notices it. And you, as a consumer, are responding to that marketing, not cognitively. It slips below the radar of, cri of critical thinking. You don't even know it's there. And I think we need to reframe this discussion. And a lot of my work has been about reframing the discussion to focus more attention on what the food industry is doing uh, to try to deflect some of that attention from personal responsibility, although I still think that personal responsibility is important. I also think that the role of food companies is greatly ignored. Okay, what are we supposed to eat? This is the Dietary Guidelines for Americans that came out in 2015. And the Dietary Guidelines, they're very hard to understand and there's a lot about them that I don't like. But the basic take home message is that you're supposed to be eating more of uh, real unprocessed foods and less of junk, what we call junk foods, rudely. Uh, highly processed foods that are of low nutrient density, high in calories, full of fat, sugar, and salt. Uh, junk foods, in other words. Um, dietary, even though the dietary guidelines are very complicated and they take 150 pages to say what they say, um, I'm fond of showing uh, the journalist Michael Pollan's summary of food advice because he can do it in seven words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really, that's all there is to it. Really. Um, I have another way of putting it, eat better, which means less processed food, eat less, move more. 
and please don't eat my book. Um, but if it seems more complicated than that, it's because the effect of the effect of that kind of very straightforward, simple, eat real food advice on the food industry. Uh, the real problem and the underlying problem with that kind of advice is that fruits, vegetables, whole grains, meat, dairy products that you cook, they're not profitable. The profits in the food industry are in highly processed added value foods where the ingredients can be purchased at very low cost and the products can sit on the shelves for a long time. That's where the money is. And that, it seems to me, is the underlying problem here. And I think the genesis of that problem has to do with what our food supply looks like. And I like this particular one because it compares body weight, the trend in body weight in the United States from 1970 to the early 2000s, to the calories in the food supply from uh, over the same time period. Um, from 1980 until 2000, the number of calories in the food supply available for consumption, not what people are actually eating, just what's available to consumption went from about 3,000 to 4,000 calories a day. Food production increased during that period. The daily requirement on average for calories is somewhere around 2,000 a day. This is for adults and little tiny babies and uh, sedentary elderly people. It's about 2,000 on average. Um, and so that's half of um, what the, is available in the food supply. So if you're a food company trying to sell your product in this situation where there's twice as much food available as anybody needs, you've got to work really hard to do that. Um, and so that was always difficult. But also starting in the early 1980s, something changed in the way that Wall Street evaluated corporations. This, the early 1980s was the advent of the shareholder value movement, which was a movement to end the business of slow returns on investment, blue chip stocks, you never hear about them anymore and instead to, produ to produce higher immediate returns on investment. <clears throat> and Wall Street has done that. And so food corporations not only have to sell food in a very competitive environment, they have to grow their profits every 90 days or their investors get very, very cross. Um, and so I actually have a lot of sympathy for food companies under these circumstances. Michelle Simon in her book Appetite for Profit some years ago talked about the pressures on food companies for public health advocates like me, from regulators who are dying to regulate them, for lawyers who are trying to sue them, and from Wall Street that simply wants them to make more money all the time. Food companies have reacted to these pressures First, by doing nothing and denying that it was their problem, it's your problem, personal responsibility, and then by desperately changing products and then fighting back. And it's the fighting back that my book is about and that I really want to talk about. So how do food companies fight back? They fight back through advertising, the thing that you're never supposed to notice. It's very difficult to get specific figures about the amount of money that food companies spend, spend on advertising specific products. But advertising age every now and then does a few. And so I've given some examples here from 2016. Classic Coke, $254 million just in the United States, just through advertising agencies. Um, Pop-Tarts, $30 million just in the United States, just through advertising agencies, and so forth. Uh, these numbers are in the millions, um, and th they spend about twice as much in other forms of advertising, slotting fees at supermarkets, um, marketing at uh, music and, and sports events, and so forth. Um, and in total, the food, restaurant, and alcohol industry spend about $30 billion a year to market their products, every penny of which is deductible as a business expense. That's how the United States supports this kind of thing. Another way that food companies sell food is by making products bigger. 
Um, the average size of restaurant meals and um, even packages in grocery stores has gone up enormously since the 1950s, I think since the 1980s. I had a doctoral student to track that. And if I had one concept that I could get across to the American public, it would be this. Larger portions have more calories. <laughs> I think this is a sufficient explanation for obesity. One other interesting thing about changes since 1980s when obesity rates started to increase, and that is the relative change in prices of food. Um, these are indexed prices of food, so this slide is a little bit complicated. But what you want to look at is the line for all foods that's right smack in the middle. The index price of fresh fruits and vegetables and processed fruits and vegetables has gone up much faster than the index price of all foods, and that of sugars, fats, and soft drinks has gone down relatively since the 1980s. So all in all, when you take all this together, it looks like the food industry, in collaboration with Uncle Sam, is encouraging us to eat more than is either good for us or that we necessarily want. But the food industry has other ways of marketing foods, and these are much, much less visible. Those are just the visible ways. And here I want to make a comparison between food companies and cigarette companies. Now, I know that food is not cigarettes. The message with cigarettes is very simple. One product, one message, don't smoke. Today, don't go outside. Um, but with food, it's much more complicated. We have to eat to live. We eat thousands and thousands of different kinds of foods. The message is much more complicated. It's eat this instead of that or eat less in general. Um, and so the food industry has adopted the cigarette industries, what's called the playbook, which is the set of strategies that you use to try to get people to ignore problems with your product. So the food industry, like the cigarette industry, blames personal responsibility, says, don't regulate us. We can take care of regulating ourselves. They fund friendly science. They partner with scientists. They attack independent science. They create front groups and they lobby, most of which are completely invisible to the general public. Now, I've been writing about these issues for quite a long time now. I wrote my first article about food industry funding of nutrition research and practice in 2001. I plagiarized, I self-plagiarized that article in my book, Food Politics, and it's included in a chapter in that book, which came out in 2002. And then when I was doing the research for Soda Politics, which was my previous book, which came out in 2015, I started um, observing and making comments about uh, Coca-Cola's funding of uh, health research and talked about it in that book. And then I've got other articles about it. So I've got a long-standing interest in food industry influence on nutrition research societies and advice to the public. Um, and so in 2015, when Soda Politics was actually at the printer and was in production, which takes a very long time, um, and it was kind of off, it, as I was working on uh, Soda Politics and I had written about these, I, I was sort of sensitized about Coca-Cola's funding of research, I started noticing more and more articles uh, that were coming out that were funded by food companies of one kind or another, Coca-Cola among them, but others as, as well. And it got so I could recognize them by their titles. And so whenever I saw an article that came out with a result favorable to the sponsor's interest, I looked to see who the sponsor was. I started posting them five at a time, summaries of them, five at a time, on my website, foodpolitics.com. And I did that for a whole year. Um, every time I had five, I stuck five of them up there. By the end of a year, I had 168 studies funded by food companies, 156 of them had results that were favorable to whoever paid for the study, and only 12 were unfavorable, even though I had begged people 
to send me industry-funded studies with unfavorable results. Okay, the scientists among you will know that this was a convenient sample. It was just whatever I happened to run across. It wasn't done very systematically. Um, so the only conclusion I could draw from it was that it's easier to find industry-funded studies with results favorable to the sponsor than it is to find industry-funded studies with unfavorable results. But there were still interesting things to observe from this list. For one thing, the list of companies that was funding this kind of research was very long. These were the makers, the sellers, or, the, or trade associations for an enormous list of products. Almost anything that you could think of. Healthy foods as well as unhealthy foods. Um, and I thought that was kind of amazing. Let me give you an example of a recent one uh, that actually isn't in the book. But you'll get the idea right away. So here's a study that came out in June. Um, mangoes are, will help you with problems with constipation better than an equivalent amount of fiber. So when I see the title of a study like that, I take one look at it and I think, who paid for this? <laughs> Bingo, the National Mango Board. Um, why would anybody else do a study like this? It's ridiculous on its face. Um, this one was sent to me yesterday morning. I just love it. It's my current favorite. It's in a journal called Scientific Reports, and it says beer prevents the cognitive deficits that occur with Alzheimer's. What? <laughs> Problem solved. The investigators are Japanese. You want to take a guess on who funded this? I mean, this was immediate. Who paid for this? Um, the Kieran Beer. In four, uh, five of the six investigators worked for Kieran Beer. So you know, these were the kinds of things that triggered my attention to this issue um, and that made me, and I'm, I was ready to start thinking about it. But the incident that made me decide to write this book occurred, I can go to the day, August 10th, 2015, when the New York Times had a front page article about how Coca-Cola was funding a group called the Global Energy Balance Network. And these were investigators at universities throughout the United States who were arguing that how much, how active you are is more important than what you eat in what your body weight is. And that, in fact, there was one of them went on, um, I had a video on the website saying, it doesn't matter what you eat or drink. All you have to do is be a little bit more active and your weight problems will be solved. And this is so contrary to um, the information that's available and so um, ridiculous on its face that even Fox News was shocked. Um, and I was, um, I was quoted in the article, um, and, I, the, and the Times ran my quote as a banner across the top of the full inside page in which the article continued, and as a result of that, nobody could miss it. And I got a lot of calls from re reporters in the following week. And to my surprise, because I had just done all this stuff about Coca-Cola's funding of research, to my surprise, the reporters were shocked. Um, the reporters couldn't believe, they were incredulous, that Coca-Cola would fund research that was so obviously self-serving. They couldn't believe that investigators would take money from Coca-Cola to do this. And they couldn't believe that universities would allow their faculty to do this. I thought, oh, I have another book to write. <laughs> and that was it. The aftermath of this particular article has been very interesting. Um, Coca-Cola, a venerable, res highly respected company, making a sugary drink, um, was shocked at the bad publicity. This is the worst publicity they've ever gotten about anything. And the uh, CEO of Coca-Cola did an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal saying, we can do better than this. This doesn't represent our company. Um, we're going to fix this right away. We're going to go transparent. We're going to post on our website every single, pub every single group and every single individual that we fund. 
And to my enormous, enormous, enormous surprise, they did exactly that. And within a month, they had um, published that, and they have continued to update it every six months. Um, this is one from last July. By last July, they're posting, and you can Google Coca-Cola Transparency, and if you're gossipy and want to know who they're paying, it's really fun to look at this website. <laughs> Um, from 2010 to 2018, they spent $146 million on partnerships with community groups and on research. They don't specify how much, but it's been about half in the past. They've also changed the way in which they fund research. But one of the things about transparency is that it has consequences and it enables analysis. And a group of investigators at UCSF, actually, <clears throat> did a study for the Annals of Internal Medicine in which they asked the question, do sugar-sweetened beverage, they should have said associated with, not cause, are sugar-sweetened beverages associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes? They found 60 studies addressing that question. Of those studies, 26 of the 60 studies said no. Sugar-sweetened beverages have nothing to do with obesity and diabetes. 25 of them were funded by industry. Of the ones that said yes, the 34 studies that said yes, only one was funded by industry. And I'm betting that whoever did that study never got funded by industry again. <laughs> The kinds of studies that Coca-Cola funded uh, fell into uh, several categories. One is that any study that shows that sugar-sweetened beverages have anything to do with obesity and type 2 diabetes is so poorly conducted that you don't have to pay any attention to it. Any statement that sugar-sweetened beverages have anything to do with disease is overstated. You can ignore it. Uh, sugar-sweetened beverages are harmless, and there's a whole series of articles about how exercise is much, much more important than what you eat uh, in what you do. But one of the things that, I, you know, I'm picking on Coca-Cola. One of the reasons I'm picking on Coca-Cola is they got caught, um, and I'll talk about some of that. But other companies did that too, and other people are writing about this kind of thing besides me. Candace Troy at the Associated Press had an article um, in 2017 about how candy makers uh, are shaping nutrition science, and she referred to a series of articles about how children and adults who eat candy are healthier than people who don't. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I love that. Sponsored by the National Confectioners Association. <laughs> well, here's one of my all-time favorites as an example of how a study um, is accompanied by a press release is a, and then is picked up by the press. So there's a study on dietary flavonoid intake from blueberries and incidence of erectile dysfunction. Um, the authors were funded by the U.S. Blueberry Highbush Council for something else that they had done. Um, the, um, one of the universities that they worked at set out a a press release that blueberries are associated with reduced risk of erectile dysfunction, yay! And the Washington Post picked it up with a headline, and the sales of blueberries went up, you guys! <laughs> Chocolate is a health food is another example. Um, don't you all believe that dark chocolate is a health food? Yeah, yeah every, doesn't everybody believe that? <laughs> Mars spent a lot of money convincing you of that, even though um, flavon the flavanols in dark chocolate are destroyed in, cho in chocolate processing, and you would need to eat a pound or more of chocolate a day to get the level of, of, of flavanol that you need. Somehow, so have fun, everybody. Um, so, uh, these, so this is the kind of thing that's a bit of a concern. <clears throat> now, there has been an enormous amount of what I now know is meta-research on the influence of industry funding on disease, uh, on 
an outcome. And a lot of that research has been done by the pharmaceutical drug industry, which is very interested in selling brand name pharmaceutical drugs rather than cheaper generics, uh, and especially cheaper generics that might work better. Um, and there has been, since 1974, or maybe even earlier, book after book after book that has talked about the influence of drug industry funding, and there are literally thousands of articles, thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. I'm going to summarize them very quickly in one slide. Um, invariably, or almost invariably, sponsored research favors the sponsor's interest. What a coincidence. The influence of gifts is there, no matter how large the gift is. Larger gifts have a bigger influence than smaller gifts. But even a pen and a pad of paper with a drug industry, with a drug logo on it, is enough to change physicians' prescription practices. And there's tons of research that shows that. What makes this complicated is that the influence of gifts is unconscious. People don't realize it. It's unintentional, it's unrecognized, and it's invariably denied. People don't realize that they're being influenced, and I'll talk about that a little bit, about how that works. The justifications for taking industry research are largely invalid. Disclosure of industry funding is necessary, but it's not enough. To manage the problem and prevention and management are essential. And in response to a recent example of drug industry financial contamination, the New York Times had an editorial pointing out <clears throat> that decades of research and, ex and examples show that financial entanglements can distort the practice of medicine in ways big and small. One reason why we know so much about drug industry research is that it's measurable. And certainly since 2010, when the Affordable, Care, the Affordable Care Act had a lot of good things about it, the Physicians Payment Sunshine Act was part of that. And that act required that drug industries disclose the amount of money that they spend um, on hospitals and on individual physicians by name. And you can go look it up. And all you have to do is go on to open payments data, cms.gov, and you can, at a glance, on the cover page, show that in 2017, more than 1,500 drug companies spent more than $8 billion on more than 600,000 doctors and more than 1,100 teaching hospitals. And therefore, people have been able, because they have this information, they've been able to measure the effect on prescription practices on decisions on advisory committees. Um, on the outcome of research and on public trust. Measurable. In contrast, the situation um, looking at funding effects in food and health is much, much more limited. In doing the research for this book, I was able to find precisely 11 studies looking at the outcome of industry-funded research on um, food and on health. Uh, the studies, the 11 studies vary. Six of them were about sugary drinks. They vary in the health effect, the methods, and the outcome. But in general, they support the kinds of conclusions that are found with drug industry funding. They favor the sponsor. They skew the research question. They put a positive spin on the results. Now, how the funding effect works has also been the subject of study. And let me introduce Lisa Biro, who used to work at UCSF, but is now at the University of Sydney in Australia. And she studies um, how bias works in research. And she reports that bias can enter into any stage of the research pro process, the question, the design, the methods, the conduct or in the reporting, but her work shows that most of the bias shows up in the research question. It's the way you ask the question. I get letters all the time from trade associations for yogurt, for pecans, for grapes, for anything you can think of, asking for proposals to demonstrate the benefits of those products on health. We're looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of yogurt on digestive function. We're looking for research to demonstrate the benefits of grapes on heart disease risk. There's a big difference between asking that question 
and saying, what is the effect of yogurt on health? Big difference. Um, and that, I think, is where the problem lies, and that's certainly what her research shows. Well, let me say that there are consequences of industry funding. Um, and th these two have been measured. Uh, sci the scientific research, the scientific risks are biasing the research agenda, the results, and the interpretations. We see distorted dietary advice as a result and loss of public trust. There are personal risks for researchers. They lose opportunity costs. People won't put them on prestigious um, committees if they're too tied to food companies. Embarrassing exposure in the press. They can appear to be sold out. And there are also personal risks for advocates like me who are um, talking about these kinds of issues. And that's what I want to talk about next. So here's Lisa Biro again. Um, and I want to talk about Lisa Biro because I went to Australia in February and March 2016 to work in Lisa Biro's group. And I was in, an, and I'm, I want to talk about what happened as a result of that. Soda Politics had just been published, it was out, um, and I was in Australia early 2016. In January 2017, a year later, you might remember that there was a big scandal about how the Russian government was hacking the emails of Hillary Clinton's campaign. You probably are wondering, why on earth am I talking about that? <laughs> well, um, earlier than that, in October 2016, um, a bunch of, of emails from Hillary Clinton's campaign people were posted on a new website called DC Leaks. And in particular, uh, there were a set of emails from an advisor to Hillary Clinton named Capricia Marshall, and her um, emails were posted on the DC Leak site. And a lot of them were very embarrassing because they were elitist. But to my enormous surprise, um, there was a set of emails between Capricia Marshall and a vice president of Coca-Cola. And um, because while she was working on Hillary Clinton's campaign, she was getting a retainer of $7,000 a month to advise or consult for Coca-Cola. Well, I heard about this from two different people. Um, I heard about it first from a, a man named Kyle Fister, who I've never met. He belongs to an organization called uh, Ninjas for Health, which Never mind, I have no idea who they are. And he contacted me and he said, Marion, you're in the emails. What? I wasn't working on Hillary Clinton's campaign. What was I doing in the emails? I was in the Coca Cola emails. And he sent me this email from a um, Coca Cola executive saying, please below find a summary of Marion Nestle's presentation at the University of Sydney. Um, she's giving this presentation. It was a very small group and it didn't have much follow-up, but we're going to be monitoring what she's doing in Australia. What? So I was in Australia at the University of Sydney. I gave a group, I gave a talk to a small group of uh, people at, for the Nutrition Society of Australia, and I vaguely remembered that somebody had come up and said, you know, there's somebody from Coca-Cola in the audience. And do you mind? And I said, no, I don't mind. My book, Soda Politics, had just come out. I assumed there was somebody from Coca-Cola at every talk I gave. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> um, so the emails went on to say, here's a summary of the key issues that she talked about. A really good summary, by the way. <laughs> Very complete notes. You want to know what I talked about, you can go up and look at, these, uh, at, at this email. And they recommended that they monitor my presence on social media, that they monitor all the presentations I was giving and who I talked to, and that they monitor what Lisa Biro was up to. And that got a, a big article in the local Sydney Morning Herald where they talked about Coca-Cola's secret plan to monitor uh, Sydney University Lisa Biro. So that made her famous. Everybody really liked that. 
Um, now, I'm completely aware that there are lots of arguments about this. And there are people who think that industry funding has no effect on what they do, uh, that it's the wrong question. And there are people who think you shouldn't take money from industry at all. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the arguments that are being made, because some of the arguments make sense. One of the arguments is that there's less government money for research and that um, universities are always telling uh, faculty that they need to raise their own money and there's more corporate funding research and where else are researchers supposed to get money and there's some truth in that. Um, federal funding for research is kind of leveling off and corporate funding is increasing. Um, and so I'm willing to concede that that argument has merit. Um, I'm less willing to concede these kinds of arguments. Uh, this is an article that was published a few years ago by some nutrition researchers, and they argued that um, the obesity researchers, they were arguing that industry funding has no influence on obesity research. Any criticism of industry funding is a personal attack and is really inappropriate in science, that career goals your beliefs about science and your, doctor and your dietary practices are just as biasing. And if you disclose your industry funding, you've taken care of the, of the problem. I go to a lot of trouble in the book to rebut all, each of those arguments. Um, in fact, those arguments are considered so stale that an ethicist at the University of Colorado came out with a conflict of interest bingo game um, in which he makes fun, and he published this in the British Medical Journal, and <clears throat> he makes fun of excuses like we're fully transparent, money doesn't influence me, management is sufficient, disclosure is sufficient, there's no evidence of any influence on it. I mean, he thinks all this stuff is ridiculous because there is so much evidence that industry funding is influential at an unconscious level. Well, if it's unconscious, it's hard to talk about. Lisa Biro has done studies on this as well. Um, and she argues, and I totally agree with her, that industry funding is, a, is different from other kinds of biases, from the career or dietary biases. Um, industry, you don't have to have industry funding to do research. You can do research without it. It's discretionary. If you look at the hypotheses in scientific research studies, you can't tell whether it's industry funded or not. In a lot, I mean, I can tell from a lot of them, but um, it's pretty hard to tell unless it's disclosed. And the important overwhelming observation is that industry funded studies come out with results that favor the sponsor's interest. You have to have a, something that explains that and the only the um, thing that explains that is this consistent bias. Whereas independently funded studies, uh, the hypotheses differ, the results are all over the place, um, and, uh, and they're different. Anyway, I would argue that they're different. I want to say something about disclosure. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine was the first journal to require investigators to say who paid for their studies, and whether they had any financial ties to the funder of the studies or to anybody else who had a financial interest in the outcome of the studies. Nutrition journals were much later in adopting those kinds of practices. Scientific journals were even much later. Um, but by now, disclosure is uh, understood to be generally a generally accepted practice, and most journals in biology or any kind of science require it. How well are the disclosure requirements followed? Mm, not as well as you might like. The New York Times said, this is a drug researcher, not a nutrition researcher, uh, but the uh, New York Times published this article in September this year, uh, a front page story about a cancer researcher at Sloan Kettering who neglected to mention in his studies this enormous collection of drug companies that he consulted with. Now, it was pretty easy to find these studies because somebody saw, somebody looked at one of his papers, saw that there were no disclosure of drug industry ties and looked them up on the website. It's really easy to do. Um, and then tipped off the New York Times and the New York Times went to town on it. 
enormously embarrassing for Sloan Kettering, and there have been a lot of changes at Sloan Kettering since. Um, let me show you what a, a, how easy it is to trigger looking for disclosure statements. Here was a study that came out a couple of weeks ago. Changes in kidney function do not differ between people who eat high and low protein diets. There have been concerns that high protein diets affect kidney function. Um, and here's a study that showed that there's no difference. I immediately went to see who paid for it. And several of the, or the senior author on this, um, receives research funding, travel support, and honoraria <coughs> from, the dairy, from dairy industry and beef industry who have an interest in demonstrating that you can eat as much protein as you want. Big problem. Disclosures are a big problem. Um, there's a uh, there, very highly respected statisticians here at Stanford um, wrote this article about disclosures in nutrition research, which they feel is different from any other kind of research, and that it's critical for nutrition researchers to disclose their advocacy and their activist work, as well as their dietary preferences. And they specified disclosure if you're a vegan, Atkins, gluten-free, high animal protein, or specific supplements. So I'm going to disclose. Um, here's my standard conflict of interest disclosure, or at least it was until a year ago. I'm actually retired from New York University now. This is what retirement looks like. Um, and so it, my salary supported my research, my website, and I get royalties from books and honorary and travel from lectures about matters that were relative to this con um, Not nearly enough money, by the way. This is a freebie. Um, and I'm an omnivore. And I love this thing about definition of omnivore, eater, consumer, glutton, gourmet, diner, epicure, devourer. That's me. I love food. Um, so that's my disclosure. I want to talk, and I end the book with a bunch of chapters on what needs to be done. And I, I have recommendations for researchers, for food companies, for reporters, and for every single one of us who is an eater. I won't go into those in enormous detail, but I tell researchers to avoid conflicts of interest if they can. Uh, the easiest way to do that is just to say no to industry funding. I wish my colleagues would at least recognize the unconscious risks of industry funding, set up a policy, set up some safeguards, and fully disclose. I think that's the best you can ask for. For reporters, I wish that reporters who write about these kinds of studies would ask about who funded the research. It's an important question, as Health, New Re Health News Review argues. And for those of us who are eaters, um, to the extent that you can, I think it's really a good idea to try to figure out whether the research is funded by somebody who has some kind of vested interest in the outcome. For those of you who don't have the option of figuring out who paid for a study or it's not said, I would, I would say just be a little bit skeptical of nutrition research. You should always watch out for studies that claim a breakthrough, studies that claim a miracle, studies that complain that the studies that proclaim that single foods are superfoods. Any study that says that a single food will cure multiple diseases, just give it a moment's thought, really? Um, and any time you hear everything you thought you knew about nutrition is wrong, a red flag should fly in the air, uh, asking you to be a little bit cautious about interpreting that. There was a fabulous example that came out this week about low-carb diets uh, that requires a considerable amount of skepticism, at least about its interpretation. Um, so what do you eat? You eat a diet that follows uh, basic dietary principles, food, um, go easy on processed and junk foods, and try to work to make an environment that makes the healthy choice the easy choice. It would be much easier for us to eat if we could do that. And these are the kinds of things I discuss in my book, books in general, and in this one in particular. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this with you today. Oh, you want me to handle the questions? I'll handle the questions. Yes. What motivation would Disney, Shout. What motivation would Disney have to 
fund studies. Ah, Disney would love for people to think that all the junk food they serve is really okay. So it has to do with their theme parks? Yeah, and at their theme parks. Yeah, they have a big interest in that, and they're eager for people to think that the kind of thing that they're um, selling there is just fine. So, yes. Um, what do I think about the UC Berkeley Wellness Letter? I'm a subscriber and I have been for years. I think it's very good. You know, it's written by UC Berkeley faculty and it's really cautious. Um, you know, every now and then they write about something that I wish they didn't, but most of the time I think it's really good and highly reliable. Yes? So I recently uh, read a book called How Not to Die, which was very... <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> I haven't oh, done, sorry. It's chock full of single food, um, miracle foods okay. that are supposed mm -hmm. to cure cancer, prevent mm -hmm. uh, all these diseases, uh, and, it's, and it cites a tremendous number of studies mm -hmm. that reinforce. Um, and I was just curious if anyone knew whether, I can't remember the name. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the book. Yes. I'm sorry? Oh, it's uh, Gregor's book. Gregor's book. Oh, yeah. I love him. I know. <clears throat> I just love him. I love him, but now I want You know, to... he has the, he's actually really a careful researcher and very careful. He's a vegan. And so he comes from a vegan perspective, but he has these little videos that I think are fabulous. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I, the title of his book, I, I don't like the title, so I, so I forgot about it. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> The, um, uh, yeah, he's very, very good, and the studies that he cites are pretty reliable. And then the only thing that you need to know is he really doesn't think that people should be eating any kind of animal products. But if, if he's talking about anything else, it's really uh, it's good, and he's really fun. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you for your talk. Um, it's a really important subject. And I just had a question. Um, well, so I'm a, I study from policy at UC Davis, and uh, so I had a question about I'm talking about what? I'm sorry. The broader context of lack of government funding and sort of your advice uh -huh. for what researchers should do given the environment, mm -hmm. lack of environmental funding, and on top or lack of funding for, for research. And on top of that, sometimes it can be even difficult to know where your funding is coming from. So just as an example, I did a study recently on food waste, and it seemed like the funding was coming through one organization, I thought, and then it, when we kind of traced it back, we realized it was actually coming through Walmart. Um, <laughs> But it, it kind of took... It was laundered. Like, like, <laughs> making works like that, right? Uh -huh. so, down. So, so, so that context. And then also, um, if you could comment. Uh, the other thing that I sort of know, face is the fact that even government funding can be sort of biased in what it tends mm -hmm. to fund towards. So, for example, if you work in organics, you have a smaller pool of even government funding to draw on. So then you mm -hmm. may be more likely to look towards, mm -hmm. you know, an organic. Company or mm -hmm. organic association for funding. So, you know, it's easy to kind of, when it's big soda or big pharma or big mm -hmm. ag, it's very nefarious, but if it's coming from organics, you know, it's still an industry, mm -hmm. but if you just have common sense. Um, let me do, deal with the organics one first. I did not write about organics in this book, um, and I did that for a very deliberate reason. Um, I did not. Actually, I didn't write about GMOs in this book, even though the industry behind the, the agricultural biotechnology industry sponsors a lot of research that comes out in its favor. I didn't write about it because I didn't want to write about organics. Um, years and years and years ago, I was contacted by the Organic Research Association um, and asked if um, I could advise them about how they could get research to demonstrate that organics were more nutritious than non-organic food. And there were some other people there too. And we advised the organic industry not to do that research. Don't do it. Organics are about production values. Um, you want to prove that organics have fewer pesticides. Go ahead and do it. This is, uh, you know, and fewer toxic pesticides. That's really important research. If you get into the nutrition area, you're going to be crossing a line. 
and getting yourself into a lot of trouble. They did not listen to me. Um, and just like every other industry-funded research, I can predict who paid for a study by whether it says organics are more nutritious or less nutritious than conventionally grown crops. Because it's not the question about organics. Their attitude was, we can't sell organics on the basis of production values. It's not enough. People won't buy them because they contain fewer pesticides, which they absolutely do. They contain fewer pesticides. We have to be able to demonstrate that it's more nutritious because that's what sells food. So my point about the kind of thing that you were talking about, and I think it covers both of your questions, is this is marketing research. This isn't basic science. This is marketing research. It's marketing that's targeted, it's research that's targeted to a marketing objective. It should be done in marketing journals. It shouldn't be in health journals. Um, or as a friend of mine in England said, we need a new journal, the Journal of Industry Funded Research, <laughs> to, put, you know, to put these studies into. Um, so I think you know, it relates that way. I wish the organic industry wouldn't do that. I really wish they wouldn't. They get into trouble over it. Um, and it reduces trust in organics, and trust in organics is a huge issue. Um, the, the organics, to the extent that they follow the organic rules, they're going to have. You know, the organic rules exist, they follow the rules, and people need to trust those rules, that those rules are being followed. The nutritional quality of the products is not involved in those rules. Um, so I don't think they should do that. Way in the back. Do you have an opinion on GMOs? You're going to have to shout. I wrote a book about them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer, to the short answer to your question is yes. Um, yeah, my book, Safe Food, The Politics of Food Safety, half the book is about GMOs. It came out in 2003, and I looked at it recently. I have to say, it holds up pretty well. Um, yeah, it's a, um, the, the GMO industry would like you to believe that safety is the only issue. I think there are lots of other issues as well. Um, I believe that the products that are on the market are probably safe to eat. Glyphosate is another matter. Um, and, the, and I think we're going to hear much more about glyphosate. Uh, but there are many, many issues about GMOs that I think are quite troubling. Who makes the decisions, the fact that they're not labeled, um, the overall attempt to control the food supply, monoculture, I could go on and on and on. But I think if you eat them, you're not going to die on the spot. Um, <laughs> yes, way in the back. Thank you for coming. And how you Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. well, um, I in working with teenagers right. nutrition, I had a great kid asking me where he could go online mm -hmm. for a credible resource, which is really great thing to ask, and then also books that I might be able to get to teenagers to help them with the cycle. Okay. Um, you know, where do you get credi credible information? My answer to that is me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, my book, What to Eat, which I think they have copies of back there, was meant for the general public to deal with food issues. Um, I read a lot of sources that I think are reasonably credible. I tend to trust government sources better than other sources because, well, I don't know how much longer we can continue to do that, but the Economic Research Service at the USDA does has I think I have to put this past tense, has done tremendous work. Uh, the Trump administration is attempting to dismantle that agency, and that will be a terrible, terrible loss. Um, so academic research that's independently funded, newsletters from respectable places, like the Berkeley Wellness Letter, um, which covers a lot of research. I think you have to get, you just have to read a lot 
and get sophisticated about which, what's trustworthy and what's not trustworthy. And you always want to use common sense. You know, does it make sense? Um, does it fit with what you thought you already knew? If it doesn't, you want to question whether you have enough information to change your mind about something. Um, I don't think it's easy. There isn't one source. I read dozens and dozens and dozens of things every week, um, trying to keep up and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, you know, I'm fortunate in that I can read the, I have access to the original research papers. I can read them myself. I know how to do that. Um, I've got a lot of experience with it. Um, but, you know, I don't know. You just have to look around a lot, read a lot, and figure it out. So, yes. There's a lot of really good information about, but I, I agree it's hard to find. Yes, right, right there. Shout. You. Shout. I recently read a book called Plant Paradox. You're going to have to stand up. I really can't hear. Um, I recently read a book called The Plant Paradox by Stephen Gundry. I don't know it. Sorry. He's basically attacking lectins. In oh, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. the enemy. Yeah, fortunately, they're destroyed in the stomach. Okay, oh. so I just wanted to know your thoughts. Yeah, I, you know, cook, if you cook your food, you know, I, it's, people have been <laughs> eating lectins for a long time. We've survived. <laughs> you know, yeah. I thought I was never caught up in the orga organic idea, but um, I was introduced to samples at the uh, farmer's market in San Francisco down at Fort Mason. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that they do taste better. Organics I mean, they taste better. Samples and they <laughs> taste mm -hmm. better. Yeah, the soils are better. So is yeah. that true? Yeah. Or was it just my yeah. imagination? Yeah, well, it depends on who's raising them and how long they've been sitting around. I, poor thing, live in New York City. And let me tell you, by the time it gets to us, whether it's organic or not, um, you, you people are so lucky and spoiled in California, you have no idea. Yes. Uh. Are what? Are two good sources, yes. 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 I would agree, those are very good sources. Yeah. I had some concerns about the quality of water oh. in the United States. And I wonder to what extent you've looked into the commodification of water and the relationship between that and, you know, we're hearing all of these reports of the deteriorated, deterioration mm -hmm. of the water infrastructure in this country. Mm -hmm. And I'm just trying to think, could those things be attached to one another? Oh, absolutely. The, the commodification absolutely. and the infrastructure yeah. report. Yeah, so the question was about water. There are some very, very good books about this. Very, very good books. And Food and Water Watch is another group that um, is very, has very reliable information. Center for Science and the Public Interest in Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, the deal with water in a nutshell is that the bottled water industry, um, as part of its marketing techniques, wants you to believe that tap water is not good for you. And what this has done is to undermine public support for public water supplies. It's a tragedy. And there are very, very good books about this. Um, for, and Food and Water Watch has a lot of stuff on its website that talks about these issues. Um, yes? I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on is there any possibility of motivating the food industry to make healthy food for us. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, it's working. Um, the question was about how can you motivate the food industry to make healthier products? All you have to do is buy them. I mean, from their standpoint, it's really simple. We would make healthier products if anybody would buy them, but people don't buy them. Here, we put out this terrific low-fat, low-sugar, low-salt product, and nobody wants to eat it. Um, so there is personal responsibility, right? They're blaming you. I think it's a terrible problem for the food industry because the products that sell, that have been marketed most heavily, are the ones that are most profitable for them. If they can't make money, they can't stay in business. You know, I mean, so food companies are not social service agencies. They're not public health agencies. They're businesses. 
And they're businesses that have stockholders that demanding higher and more immediate returns on investment every day. That's really what they're about. So to expect them to produce foods that are going to promote health is totally unreasonable. It doesn't make any sense unless they have a business model where it sells. You know, I mean, kind bars? Now, kind bars are, were a new invention from a guy who's a really smart marketer, um, and he's marketing them as healthy, and they're sold everywhere, and they're everywhere in the world, and they're on airplanes and hotels. And you can't go anywhere without seeing kind bars. Are they healthier? They got nuts in them. <laughs> they do. Whole nuts, you can see them, they're right there. <laughs> they're right there. I actually don't think they're sweet enough, but never mind. Um, but never mind. I mean, so that's an example of a huge success story, an enormous success story. Um, but for Coca-Cola to change its products is much more difficult. After my book, Soda Politics, came out, I went for the first time to Coca-Cola World in Atlanta. Any of you ever been there? Anytime you go to Atlanta, don't miss it. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. So you go through, and they have this um, video that you have to watch that's very, very touching. And, and then it is. Everybody cried. I cried. And then you go through, and you look at the history of Coca-Cola and, and all of this thing. And then you go up to a tasting floor where they have this enormous space where they've got um, maybe 50 to 100 different Coca-Cola products from all over the world, and I tasted them. And I have to tell you, Coca-Cola Classic tastes better than any of the others. And then you go to the gift shop, which is about the size of this space, and there were people lined up with shopping carts buying Coca-Cola toys, Coca-Cola candy, Coca-Cola silverware, Coca-Cola. I mean, anything, it was, amazing. it was an amazing place. Um, but the product taste, that's what people want to buy. And I don't know who buys them, I don't, but somebody does. And they're, they're desperate to find a product that people will buy it the same way that they'll buy classic Coca-Cola. Are they putting as much money into marketing? Of course not. Complicated. Yes. Well, in terms of um, influencing big food to produce products that are healthier, perhaps we could vote with our dollars by supporting some food disruptors today, uh, small capitalists who are producing better and healthier foods, which then are being purchased by companies like General Mills and Coca-Cola. And that's one way we can begin to see a shift in the entire paradigm of what big food will produce in mass market. Yeah, and there's a, the question, the, I mean, then there's no question it's already happening. I mean, look at all the companies that have taken artificial colors out of their products. Is artificial colors the big issue in food? No, but it's nice that they're gone. Um, they didn't need to be there, and the, um, you know, that's a step. And there are lots of other companies that are trying to reduce the sugar, trying to reduce the salt. Um, and to the extent that they can get away with it and people don't notice, they'll do it. I think regulations would be really helpful, but we're not going to have regulations, at least for a while. Uh, and so you vote with your fork. You buy, every time you, you make a food pro purchase, you're voting with your fork for what you think is the right kind of food. If you shop at farmer's markets, you're supporting local farmers. If you buy artisanal food, you're supporting the people who are making those foods. That, that's making a difference. And every big food company knows that. They know that you, this audience, right here in this room, are the influencers that they want to influence in the, um, in the food system. So you are having a big effect on what they're doing. They're struggling to figure out how they're going to deal with the pressures to make healthier and more environmentally sustainable food, because those are the two big issues. Um, they're all struggling with it. If you have any ideas for them, you should let them know. Yes? I'm probably going to put this in a politically inappropriate way, but I kind of think the people in this room are the 1%. And so you've got the 1%, and then you have 99%. 
maybe don't have the opportunity mm -hmm. to buy, to speak with their wallets in the mm -hmm. same way that I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, now we're into food politics in a serious way. Um, I showed you the slide of the indexed cost of foods and showed you that fruits and vegetables and healthy food are relatively more expensive than junk food. That has a lot to do with federal policies on what gets subsidized, what gets supported, um, and remember that every penny of marketing of junk food is deductible as a business expense. So we need to change the political system. That's what that's about. You vote with your vote with your fork. You also vote with your vote. No. Yes. I'm curious about the impact of research. Do companies do they care more about the marketing impacts? In other words, I don't read a lot of research in the press. Are they hoping that people buy the product? because the research is favorable, or are they trying to protect more perhaps against uh, negative regulation? Well, they're doing, it depends on what they're, they're making. If you're a blueberry producer, you want people to think that blueberries have antioxidants that are going to prevent 20 different diseases. Whether they do or not is, a, is another question, but if you've got a study that shows that blueberries are great for health, maybe more men will eat blueberries. That's what they want. They're looking for market share. There's basic research about food. Um, you know, how do we develop better food varieties? How do we get more nutrients into foods? That's food science. That is invariably supported by the food industry, but there's no conflict of interest because they're both on the same side on that. It's when you get into the studies that are looking at food products and health looking for something for which you can make a health claim that will help sell the product, that I get upset. Um, so it's Coca-Cola doing the defending of sugary beverages, which I think almost everybody would agree that you'd be much better off not drinking sugary beverages or drinking them in very small amounts. Um, but for I'm in favor of people eating more fruits and vegetables. But if you just give it a moment's thought, we eat a variety of foods. Does it really matter whether you eat pecans or walnuts? Really? <laughs> you know, you should be eating both of them yeah. in not too enormous quantities. Um, and, and that's, you know, a healthy diets have a variety of unprocessed foods. There was a study that came out quite recently that variety is really bad for you. If you eat a variety of foods, you're going to be fatter. Um, but what kind of foods? Yeah, if you eat a, you eat a variety, uh, that was in the American Heart Association Journal. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, but the advice is to eat a variety of healthy foods. Um, so yeah, eat blueberries, eat strawberries, eat raspberries, eat blackberries. I don't know. I mean, mix and match. That takes care of nutrient. That takes care of nutrients. Enjoy what you're eating. Food is one of life's greatest pleasures. I get so upset when I meet people who are, so, who are really anxious about what they're eating. It should be food should be delicious. You should eat it, just not too much. I don't know. That's kind of where I'm coming from on this. Um, should we? Nobody else. One more. Yes. Well, it's, it's in there all the way through because organics are much more expensive than conventionally grown food for very good reason. Um, it takes much more labor to get into there. I mean, our food system, and I probably talk about food system most in my book, What to Eat, you know, our food system has inequities built into it. Just look at what we pay farm laborers. You know, there you go. Or what we pay restaurant workers. Uh, so it, it underlies, it's not what I'm dealing with specifically, but it's in there. So in pretty much everything I write about, at least I hope it is, yes. One last one. <laughs> now I'm wondering if stuff I've read is true or not. Um, over the years there's been conflicting reports on coconut oil. On coconut oil. Yeah. And when I, look at, when I look at it in the jar, I can't imagine that in my arteries. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what am I going to say about coconut oil? You know what I'm going to say. Everything in moderation. 
Um, you know, uh, well, canola oil is less saturated. There's a, a new paper that just came out this today in Science that is kind of a, a, a review of the situation on dietary fat. And uh, so they got together a group of people who don't agree about dietary fat to see where their consensus statement was. And their consensus statement is that unsaturated fatty acids are healthier than saturated ones. But uh, any food fat, any food fat, even coconut oil, is a mixture of saturated, unsaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. They're just in different proportions. You never want to focus on one thing. You always want to mix the foods you're eating, mix the kinds of oils you're using, mix the kinds of things you're putting the oils on. and. You know, I love the taste of coconut oil, uh, but you don't need very much to get a really great taste. Enjoy it if you like it, don't eat it if you're worried about it, and definitely in moderation. Yes? Is moderation and variety a good principle for dietary health? I think moderation and variety are essential if, they're, if they have subtitles. Uh, so for variety, it's variety of healthy foods. For moderation, it's how do you define it, and that's going to be different for every individual. Um, somebody once did a, a survey of what moderation meant, and she surveyed no nutritionists. It was really funny. Um, everybody had a different opinion. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people, moderation is less than what they're, most people understand moderation to mean less than what they're eating. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're not gaining weight, you're probably eating fine as far as the quantity goes. And then enjoy what you're eating. You know, I mean, really, food is so wonderful. In fact, I'm thinking of food right now. <laughs> so much so that I'm going to make those two the last questions. First you, and then you're the last question. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on um, our Western fear of hunger, a feeling comes from being hungry, and um, <laughs> Yeah, the question is, why are we so worried about hunger? Well, we're worried about hunger because it's a horrible feeling. If you're really seriously, if you're really seriously hunger, hungry, it's not fun. It's really not fun. And people who are starving, you know, there's an enormous literature on starvation, and I can tell you that it's not pleasant. But that's not what you're talking about. I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm related. Mm. Mm -hmm. and why that, that is just, and I know that it's gaining ground in our country. And if you well, I think it depends on who you're talking about. I mean, fasting is built into a lot of religions, um, and it used to be more so, but I, I mean, what I'm hearing from you is the business about people not waiting until they're hungry to eat. I'm not a breakfast eater. Um, I don't eat breakfast. I don't get hungry until 10.30, 11, 11.30, sometimes not even until noon. Um, and I like to eat when I'm hungry. I've been told that I am very unusual um, in that respect. Um, but I don't think that, uh, I worry a lot about what goes on in schools these days, where there seems to be the attitude that no child can go for more than two hours without being given something to eat. That's not how I grew up, it's not how my kids were raised, and I think it has a great deal to do with obesity in our society. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that, that your question strikes in me, and I think different individuals handle it in different ways. Um, but yeah, I think you, know, you wanna manage your weight, one way to manage your weight is to stretch 
the eating times out a little bit and eat when you're hungry. It's, the food tastes much better. <laughs> it really does. I don't know if that helps. Okay, there was one more, and then that's the last one. You live in one of the most wonderful places with great restaurants mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. When you go into a restaurant, what can you order to eat? <laughs> oh. Is it hard to figure out? Or? No, the big problem in restaurants is the quantity. It's the quantity of food. You know, I used to, when I went to restaurants, I would order an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. Now I'm down to an appetizer. I mean, part of it is I can't eat the way I used to because as you get older, your metabolism slows down and you just can't eat the way you used to. It's the dirtiest trick about getting older. <laughs> really dirty trick. Um, but I'm appalled by what restaurants serve. All but the very, very top line restaurants serve enough for what I think is six people. I'm not joking. You know, you get a salad on your plate and you look at that salad. It's what I used to serve my family. Um, and what am I supposed to do with it? Well, I could take it home. And I do that a lot. And then eat it for the, you know, but then you don't want old food. Or, I mean, it's complicated. I order less and less at restaurants. And I'm more and more unhappy about it. Um, if I do, if I'm confronted with a lot of food, I take it home. But you always eat more if you're confronted with a lot of food than you do if it's a small portion. Um, but I eat in restaurants all the time and have to deal with it every day. You just learn how to manage it. So I'm going to stop here because I'm running out of voice. But thank you very much. And, and I just want to say one more thing. I just want to say you've been a great audience, Thank, and I, I really feel privileged to be here. Thank you.